And I'm going to turn this program over to Kaysen Romanowski. Thank you. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Kaysen Romanowski. I am a proud senior here at Columbia High School, and I share my warmest personal welcome here with all of you tonight. I believe you know the following, our legislators and elected officials here. However, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce each one of them tonight. I ask that you please hold your applause until the end of the introductions. Tonight we have New York Senator, Mr. Neil Breslin. So every time you say hold your applause, someone has to applaud. <laughs> we have Legislative Assistant to Senator James Tedisco, Mr. Alex Blazinski. Legislative Director to Senator Daphne Jordan, Mr. Patrick Cronin. New York State Assembly Member, Mr. Jake Ashby. New York State Assembly Member, Ms. Patricia, Patricia Fahey. Assembly Member, Mr. John McDonald, who will be here very soon. Assembly, Assembly Member, Ms. Mary Beth Walsh. And finally, Legislative Director to Assemblyman Phil Steck, Ms. Allison McLean Lane. In addition, in addition, tonight we have attendance from a wide variety of people. We have town board members, local school board members, superintendents, assistant superintendents, administrators, teachers, support staff, students, parents, guardians, and other people from the community. We'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. Tonight, we're all here because we each represent an individual piece of the educational puzzle. And that puzzle is the education system we have here in the greater capital region. While we're all very different people here tonight, we each have a common denominator. And that's quite simple. Each of us is a stakeholder in the education of our area and the education of our children. Tonight, we're going to learn about the growing challenges that face each and every one of us in this room. Of equal importance, you'll see here the many accomplishments from the 10 school districts that are here representing tonight. And I think you, can all, you will all agree that they are each very impressive. Without any further ado, please join me in welcoming the Columbia High School Chamber Singers under, dire under the direction of Miss Shelley Badger to the stage to perform the national anthem. Please rise and remove your cap if you are wearing any. If you are walking tonight, please stop as we get ready for the national anthem. Stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets red the bombs bursting. That was a beautiful performance, I'm sure you can all agree on. But before you all sit down, we ask that you please stay standing. I'd like to introduce, like to introduce Margaret Thayer and Noah Parker from the Clayton A. Boughton High School, representing the Voorheesville Central School District, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, 
one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Margaret and Noah. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce you to the Superintendent of Schools for the East Greenbush Central School District, Mr. Jeff Simons. He, tonight he's going to share the overview of this evening's program. Good evening, everyone, and I want to begin by welcoming all of you to Columbia High School, uh, a little bit about Columbia High School. Uh, Columbia High School has just achieved a 96% graduation rate, and we are one of only 131 high schools over the past two years who have received both a recognition school award from the New York State Education Department as well as a reward school. A recognition schools and reward schools are uh, recognitions of high schools who have achieved outstanding English, mathematics, regents test performance, while at the same time closing the gap between the overall performance of our students and subgroups of students, such as our students with disabilities and our economically disadvantaged students. And in fact, the most recently released graduation rate data indicated a point of pride for our district where we have closed the gap between those students identified as economically disadvantaged and all students by 11% in one year. Columbia High School has also been recognized twice within the last 10 years by US News and World Report as one of the nation's best high schools. And we like to say that we do so well at our high school, but that work starts in kindergarten when our kids come in as five-year-olds, in some cases as four-year-olds, and it continues until the time that they cross the graduation stage. So welcome to Columbia High School. Welcome to the community of East Greenbush. I want to thank the students who are leading this forum this evening. We have been working with students from each of the 10 districts represented at this forum. Our students who participate in government classes, student leadership roles within their respective districts have helped to organize and plan this forum. And we hope that it will be instructive, not critical, informative, not adversarial, and we hope to shine a spotlight on the financial issues that may not become apparent or visible as we talk about 700 schools in New York State and the recognition that everyone needs more school support in terms of foundation aid to be able to continue to meet the needs of students. But when you look at the overall picture, we are average wealth districts, and we are remarkably the same in the fact that over the course of the last three years, each of the districts represented this evening have received the minimum amount of state aid increase that any district received in New York State. In fact, in the case of all of our districts, it was about a 0.75% increase. Interestingly, that increase, being the lowest in New York State, has also declined each year over the last three years. So we're not only getting what's left over as the foundation aid is distributed through schools in New York State, what's left over is getting smaller and smaller. And we are concerned that if the trend in state aid continues for our average wealth districts, we're not going to be able to sustain some of the wonderful programs that you're about to hear about in each of our respective districts represented here at the forum. So I'm going to turn the microphone back over to Kaysen in just a minute. But before I do so, I want the public to understand that our legislators are very busy people. And their staffers are very busy people. And in each one of their calendars, they probably had five or six or maybe more commitments tonight. But they made the decision to attend this because they have supported our public schools. And they continue to want to advocate for us. So we appreciate that they have taken the time from very busy lives and very busy schedules to come here to Columbia High School this evening to hear our concerns and to learn about our schools. So can we give one more round of applause for our legislators who are here and their representatives. Kaysen. Thank you, Mr. Simons. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Patrick McGrath, the Superintendent of Schools for the Burnt Hills-Boston Lake Central School District, for a presentation on, on trending 
on these state aid trends. Dr. McGrath. Thanks, Kason. Hi, everyone. My name is Patrick McGrath. I'm the superintendent of schools at Burn Hills Boston Lake, as you just heard. Welcome to our legislators and the families and the teachers and the leadership of the 10 districts that came together tonight to have uh, some thoughtful, proactive conversations about um, some important long-term concerns that we have as school districts. We're an interesting collection of districts. We're a group of average to below average wealth districts in New York State, and this chart provides some numbers that paint a picture of the financial status of the districts here tonight. The middle column shows each of our combined wealth ratios. This is a measure of the property, income, and wealth behind each student in a particular school district, the property wealth and the income wealth combined together. Unlike the very subjective categories of low needs, average needs, high needs, these, that which are based on decades old data, the state sets this number annually with 1.0 always being reset as the average. You can see that most of us most of the district represented here are below the state average in combined wealth ratio. Two districts here are right at the average, and two districts on the list that show a number a bit higher than average are sparsely populated districts with a large amount of land in relation to a smaller number of students, which tends to skew this number. The free and reduced lunch percentages in the next column for these districts, between 40 and 60 percent, tell the real story about the needs that these districts face. The bottom line is this. We are a group of average wealth districts, at best, for our region and for our state. You may wonder what specifically brought the 10 of us together. Mr. Simons alluded to that. I will answer it after a brief review of how school districts fund their programs. So school districts are required by law to create a balanced budget. And we know that they present that plan to the voters annually every year. We have to have it approved. At the end of the process, no matter what, we'll always balance our budget. We can only propose expenditures that are, fun, that are fully supported by revenue and possibly a limited amount of savings and fund balance from time to time. Two major sources of revenue for these districts here in this room are the local tax levy and foundation aid. Now the local tax levy essentially is connected to inflation by the tax cap legislation. So the local tax levy is relatively predictable for us. Foundation aid is set by the state legislature year to year. And this really proves to be a difficult part of our budgeting process. The 10 of us, our type of district, we really do rely on state aid. This slide shows the percent to which state aid funds each of our operations. It comprises between 25 and 40% of our revenue. The total state aid received is of critical importance to our revenue budget. And yet, the state of New York sets this number at the very last minute in our budget process. We can never predict it. The state requires that we adopt a budget by around April 20th in preparation for a major vote in May, but we're only finding out how much operating aid that we have in early April. To make matters more confusing and uncertain, this year the governor is proposing to roll expense-based aid into foundation aid. If this happens, it makes the message I'm about to deliver even more important, since almost all of our state aid would then be foundation aid, making it all subject to the uncertainty of the legislative process. So this is what brings the 10 of these districts together. For the past several years, and continuing into this upcoming budget year, we've been placed into what has been termed the minimum foundation aid increase bucket. And we're noticed a disturbing trend with respect to this dubious label, which we've all been given. If either the governor's or regent's proposal is accepted, again, with all the, the volatile expense-based aid proposals aside, these 10 districts, for the third year in a row, will receive foundation aid increases that fall well below the rate of inflation. This is the language of the governor's budget, due minimum. It shows the mentality of how districts feel like they are proposed in, the, in this process. Now, under the currently proposed governor's budget, when you take out the proposed rolling of expense-based aid, again, quite, that's up in the air, and we don't understand exactly whether that will go through at this, even at this date in our budget process, but seven of the 10 districts in the room are categorized as Tier E districts, and they will receive a 0.25% increase in foundation aid at a time when inflation, represented by the orange line, is nearly 2%. The other three in the room, designated as Tier B, don't fare much better. They would also receive subinflationary increases. East Greenbush, for example, would receive a foundation aid increase of 
Even the Regis proposal, which is typically the most generous, proposed a minimum foundation aid increase of 1%, essentially half the rate of inflation. Now, please don't underestimate the importance of inflation. We all recognize that inflation occurs. To provide exactly the same services from one year to the next simply costs a little more. We all understand that. It makes sense. What we don't always think about is how that applies on the large scale. For instance, let's assume 2% inflation. It wouldn't surprise you if a loaf of bread that cost $2 this year cost $2.04 next year. It's intuitive, right? But scale that up to, the, to a district-sized school budget, and simply based on inflation, and many of our cost drivers actually outpace inflation, but simply based on inflation, next year it will cost 71400000 to do exactly the same thing that we did for $70 million this year. That's an increase of $1.4 million. Go forward one slide there for me, and, that, and, and that just, to, just to make the point, an inflationary increase of 1.4 million just based on 2% inflation. This is actually the numbers that came through my district, 1.4 million. And last year, we had a foundation aid increase of 101,000. This year, if the governor's expense-based aid consolation does not go through, our district's due minimum increase is proposed to be 40,000 on a $1.4 million inflationary increase. Now the difference, might, the difference must be made up, the budget must be balanced, and so it's done through local tax levy, which is obviously capped at a certain point, the judicious use of, of fund balance, and program reductions. Now if this was a one-time thing or a one-year thing, it would be something that we could certainly weather, and we understand that there's other priorities in the state and there's other districts with higher needs than ours. We are fiscally responsible and we have five-year fiscal plans in place that allow us to weather short-term difficulties. However, if we're going to be consistently placed in this low priority minimum increase group, simple economics dictates that it will have a noticeable and detrimental impact on the education provided in these 10 districts. Again, we're a group of average wealth districts at best. We're placed in exactly the same bucket as other low priority districts, such as Scarsdale, Chappaqua, and Jericho. These districts with combined wealth ratios of two to four times the state average and little poverty only rely on state aid to fund a tiny fraction of their revenue. Changes to foundation aid hardly affects these districts at all. But we're placed in that same group, and seemingly the same priority. Minimum foundation increase group. And I can assure you that for our kids, for our programs, for our local taxpayers, foundation aid that increases at a rate far below inflation year after year does have a significant impact. As I close, I want you to think about this. The reason revenue is important is because of what we spend it on, our students. When revenue falls below inflation, revenue is declining. And when revenue is declining, reductions are inevitable. Here's a simple way to look at it. The expenditure budget in a typical school can be viewed as a pie that's funded by revenue. A growing slice of that pie is being devoted to meeting basic student needs. Food, physical and mental health, ENL, trauma, dependence, special education costs. These are critical challenges. We must meet these basic challenges and these basic needs first. They can't be ignored. In fact, they're also largely mandated. They can't be ignored. So they're budgeted in for first, and there's really no opportunity to make reductions there. If anything, these needs are growing. After we meet basic needs, the next most critical slice of the pie is core educational programming, the three R's, the, the social studies and science, uh, next generation standards, regents curriculum, honors, AP courses. There's some flexibility in expenditures here. Certainly, we can increase class sizes, reduce materials and supplies, cut back on related administrative costs, but reductions in these areas do affect the core mission of our schools, so this is a last resort. However, if revenue does not grow to support the basic inflationary cost of maintaining these programs, we are forced to make these reductions. The final slice of the pie is the wide variety of elective academics, enrichment, and extracurricular activities that enhance our students' experiences and oftentimes are the most exciting and engaging aspect of our students' time in school. Study after study show that these experiences are connected to higher academic performance and higher graduation rates. If revenue does not grow to support the basic inflationary cost of maintaining these programs, this is an area which we are forced to make reductions. In other words, we have two factors working against us. 
Basic mandated needs continue to take up a larger slice of the expenditure pie, and the pie is not increasing at the rate of inflation. So here's our request. We're not asking for a lot. We recognize tremendous needs in many places in our state. We recognize the tax burden has already placed on our homeowners and our small businesses. We recognize and affirm the need to exercise fiscal restraint. The tax cap, understandably, connects our ability to raise local revenue to inflation. In the same way, we simply ask that the minimum foundation aid increases are also indexed to inflation. And if schools are asked to do more, more things, to meet a greater share of basic student needs through new legislation or new regulations, we ask that you support these new mandates and new expectations with the corresponding funding. We commit to long-range planning, diligent oversight of the funding that you entrust to us, creating world-class educational experiences for our kids. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you, thank you, Dr. McGrath. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. David Perry, the Superintendent of Schools for the South County Central School District, for presentation on the increasing needs of our students. Dr. Perry, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, for attending this important forum this evening, and thank you to all of our uh, districts for joining us in this combined effort. I'm here tonight to talk about access and opportunity for our students, the cost of quality programming. I think we would all agree that excellent public schools accept all children, regardless of the need or specific challenges that they face. From a standpoint of making sure everyone can be accessible, successful and a contributing member of our society, it is important that we not only accept these challenges, but that we embrace the vision of programming and providing for our children the access and opportunity that they deserve. Access to quality educational programming and opportunities to grow, achieve, and become active participants in our society. Most would agree that in a democratic society that the role of quality education for all becomes critical. I think I can say for all the school districts here they were proud to serve our communities and work to the best of our abilities to provide access and opportunities for our students. As quality educational institutions have evolved, they have come to understand that access and opportunity for all requires multiple approaches, different models, and sometimes additional resources. If we truly work to make sure that all students leave our systems with sound basic educational backgrounds, we need to understand that some costs will be associated with justifying these approaches. So I'm here to talk to you about several of the programs as shining examples of what helps our students become successful. Students with special needs. Students have, who have been identified as needing additional supports in one way or another often grow at different paces within our system making sure that these students are provided appropriate academic growth opportunities with a scaffolding level of support which can be added to or reduced depending upon the child's individual education program is vitally important. Students with special needs have more access and opportunities than ever before in excellent public schools. To achieve this success, schools have worked hard to provide a wide continuum of services which range from co-taught classrooms to small, specialized six to one to four programs, learning environments for all. Alternative education programs. For students who have not been successful in a larger learning environment, it is important to offer models which reduce distractions, provide more individualized attention, and allow for enhanced support, such as additional counseling, ongoing communication with families, through social workers, sometimes individual tutoring, and if needed, credit recovery. Regardless of the cause or the challenge, it is very important for these students to grow, to succeed, and to graduate from high school. The cost for society if these students do not progress and move forward is much higher than the cost of quality alternative education funding programs. Most of these students can find success if they are provided the appropriate model of support and combine that with clear expectations and a steadfast encouragement. English language learners. Many of the districts in the capital region are becoming more and more diverse 
with the children entering our systems from all over the world. In South Colony, we are working with approximately 20 different languages across our eight schools. With time and the correct levels of support, these ELL students will acclimate to our school systems, will grow, and eventually excel within our programs. As would be expected, these students do require additional academic programming to make sure their story is a success and a reality. Schools have to adjust this new dynamic, but as would be expected, costs are associated with this change and oftentimes staffing levels and program adjustments come into play. Early intervention. Many schools in the area have worked toward implementing early intervention programs. While not always mandated, we know that these programs help each student not only catch up, but enter elementary school at or near grade level for achievement. Any effort to get our children off to a great start is critical, and programs such as UPK, kindergarten, elementary summer literacy can make a huge difference in the success for all students. Mental health services. Schools have come to understand that the whole child needs to be healthy in order to grow and succeed. Mental health and overall well-being continues to play a major role in the success of our students. As we continue to add critical supports, such as clinical services within our school walls, it's become more important to understand that some new costs are associated with the additional level of support. I wanted to take a moment to introduce one of the students who are representing South Colony and Colony Central High School this evening. With me tonight is 11th grader Ava Coogan. Ava, please stand up. Ava, thank you for being here, and thanks to Ava's father for getting her here tonight. We all know that's a challenge. But she thought it was important enough. I had an opportunity to sit down with her and talk about her experiences at the high school and also what her plans are for the future and how some of the combined programs that we have have aided her in the success that she has. She's been involved with AP exams. She's been involved with the extracurriculars that Dr. McGrath had talked about. All those things that are important in the success of an overall well-rounded student. So again, Ava, thank you for being here tonight and thank you to all of our students uh, who came out to be part of our program this evening. Some fantastic individuals and uh, also, Jason, very nice uh, to meet you again. In summary, we can and should expect excellent results from all of our children in our public schools. The reality is, in order to do this, safety nets and wide range of programming must be in place. We are all here because we are concerned that unless some of the formula changes take place, or that we look at the fair and equitable distribution of foundation aid to all schools that will struggle to maintain the level of programming necessary to serve all of our students. So I thank you for listening this evening and I wish you all well. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Perry. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you all to Ms. Leslie Whitcomb, the Superintendent of Schools for the New Lebanon Central School District. She's going to be presenting us on the importance of college and career readiness in high schools. Ms. Whitcomb, everyone. I am the very proud Superintendent of Schools in New Lebanon Central Schools. I'm joined here by Joseph Aquario. He is an accomplished senior in our school, and I will give him a second at the mic, but right now I'm going to hog it and tell you about the, my heart where it is, and what is going on in our school. And it's true of all the colleagues that I've got here tonight. Teachers, thank you for coming out. Board members, community members. We're, we are together all dedicated to meeting the responsibilities that prepare the children of our communities to pursue the goals, the careers, the continued education that they have in their hearts. This is the whole point of public education, is to prepare people to become really great adults here in New York State. It wasn't too long ago that a Regents diploma, simple Regents, was that ticket to that adult life. But now, our economy, our technology, our society, they all require far more than a basic Regents diploma. New York has a long tradition of great pride in a highly skilled and very well-educated workforce. 
and we aim to continue that tradition. This is what we do in our public schools. We do it in service to our students, in service to our families, in service to our commu communities, and in service to the employers here in New York State. In New Lebanon, here's what that looks like. 83% of this year's senior class is going to graduate with credits on a SUNY transcript. We're really proud of that. Over 50 college credits are available to our students. We require a higher requirement for mathematics to graduate in New Lebanon. Four years of mathematics, that's one year more than New York State basic regents require. We have high standards. We are preparing our kids. Basic computer programming starts in third grade. It continues every year with programming and computer science all the way through high school for the kids who are pursuing that. And we really want to have engagement throughout our school day rich electives in our high school, and they ensure that we eliminate or minimize time in study hall, and instead, time in high energy, high interest classes, so that our kids can know better what's out there for them when they graduate, when they join the workforce, when they go to college. We have 85% performance in our music program. Kids up on stage, almost our whole school is singing or playing instruments. We want them to enjoy every bit of the richness of life. And we have them living the importance of a healthy mind and a body. Daily recreation guided through staff members in every grade, K through 12. And instruction and mindfulness strategies, grades pre-K through 12. We also provide access to technical certificates. Those programs for students who are seeking an immediate approach to career. And even more so, Every single high school student meets one-on-one -on -one with a counselor every single year on an ongoing basis to update their four-year career and college plan and make sure that they are taking the courses that are meeting that plan as they adjust it. So this is when I'm going to give it over to Joe. I'm going to let Joe give you a chance to let you know how he has personally benefited from our college credit courses in New Lebanon. Joe? Thank you, Ms. Wickham. Uh, my name is Joseph Aquario, and I'm a senior at New Lebanon Junior Senior High School. And I just want to take a brief minute to elaborate on the uh, college courses that anyone in New Lebanon can take. We have 51 college courses that you could take in high school and that will transfer right over to college, any college that you would like to go to. Uh, I am in the college courses, and they helped me a great deal in high school, and they will help me a great deal in college. Um, they give me a full college experience. The uh, work is the same as what I'd be taking in college. And when I get to college, I'm prepared for, I'm going into business administration. It will help me a great deal. I know the material. I know what I'm going to be going into. And I'm really glad that New Lebanon has this. So any, anyone could take it in high school, and it'll definitely transfer to any college that you'd like to go to. So I'm very thankful for that. Good. So that's what preparing our kids looks like. Looks good, right? And uh, the greatest resource that we need to sustain these programs is staff. We are in the people business. As the case with most of my colleagues here, and they're talking about the part of the budget that goes up for the staff, about 75% of our budget in New Lebanon is required to provide the salaries and benefits for the staff that make career and college readiness a reality. To continue to meet that need, for our communities, we have to support training and maintaining sufficient staff to provide these programs, training and maintaining sufficient staff to assist the academically struggling students so they can be ready, training and maintaining staff and physical plans to meet safety and mental health needs of our students, providing assistance for students who need extra support to challenge even the most difficult courses, An intensive faculty is deployed to see that their students are youngest students, are reading at or above grade level by the end of grade three. It starts with our littlest ones. And we have a duty to su sustain career readiness. We have a responsibility to remain within our tax cap. And we're faced with yearly limiting financial resources to maintain that staff in the programs we need. Dwindling resources threaten college readiness because they threaten our ability to support the staff required for these programs. We really fear the future in which we can support only a basic regents diploma. So if we have to make that ch sad choice, we won't prepare our students to reach their individual potential, and we threaten that well-prepared workforce that has been the absolute pride of New York State. 
We all want the same thing, family, schools, businesses, government. We want a bright future for New Yorkers. And I know I sound strident, but like I said, this is my heart. And it is the heart of all of our faculty and staff in our schools. Thank you, New Lab teachers. And thank you all for coming out and supporting a bright future. Thank you both to Joe and Miss Whitcomb. That was wonderful. Now I'd like to introduce you all to Mr. Jason Chevier, the Superintendent of Schools for the Skodak Central School District, for a presentation on innovative programs. Mr. Chevier, everyone. So good evening, everyone. My name is Jason Chevier, and as mentioned, I'm the Superintendent of the Skodak Central School District. I'd like to first thank Mr. Simons and the members of the advocacy team here in the East Greenbush Central School District for making this event possible tonight. Can we give them a nice round of applause, please? <laughs> the Skodak Central School District is a small rural school with approximately 875 students in grades K-12. Despite the challenges we face as a rural school, we have seen our share of success over the last few years. Skodak has had the distinction of having the highest graduation rate in the Capital District, and in 2017, Maple Hill High School was named a National Blue Ribbon School of Excellence. Skodak has built a reputation for academic excellence, forward thinking, and innovation. Only last year, we, re we reconfigured our district from three school buildings to two, creating a K-6, 712 schools. Our newly designed Maple Hill Junior Senior High School was highlighted by the New York State School Boards Association for its creative design and non-traditional learning spaces that offer new instructional opportunities for teachers and encourage students to collaborate, work as teams, and build a connection to their school. The district's innovative incubator program was designed to connect our students and teachers with startup entrepreneurs that were focused primarily on green and renewable energies. We used the space in our basement to leverage the relationship between entrepreneur, student, and teacher to connect the science to what was being learned in the classroom. Through this collaborative effort, SolarSAL, one of the first fully solar-powered boats, was built in a bay in our bus garage. Students and teachers learned firsthand about the process before the boat was launched on the Hudson River out of Skodak Island State Park. As we prepare our students for a rapidly changing workforce and strive to ready them for jobs that do not even exist yet, we focus on fostering creativity, problem solving, and collaboration at, its early, at our earliest levels. We have recently created an innovative learning lab at our elementary school in which students are afforded unique and enhanced opportunities in the critical areas of science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math through flexible collaborations between the teacher in this space and regular classroom teachers. It is important to recognize that all of these accomplishments come at a cost. For decades, we have had a thoughtful school board that has supported and encouraged its administration and outstanding faculty to think outside of the box, to be creative, and to constantly seek new opportunities for students. We take great pride in the fact that the values of our community have always been reflected at the core of our schools. Receiving minimal state aid increases annually poses challenge to our schools and places the burden directly on the shoulders of our community's taxpayers. Each budget season, we meticulously review current offerings and struggle with how we add needed programs, create new opportunities, or provide critical services to our students. Often, sacrifices must be made for the sake of adding new opportunities, thus challenging the core beliefs and values that our communities hold so dear. All we ask is that we work together to find solutions to provide adequate funding to all of our schools so that all of our students can be ready for the world of tomorrow while maintaining the standards and values our communities have come to expect from their schools. At this time, I would like to introduce one of our outstanding seniors. This is Michaela Mayer. Uh, Michaela is actively involved in a multitude of activities at school, including volleyball, drama, science Olympiad, 
and also serves as a student representative on our Board of Education. In the past year alone, Michaela has accrued well over 175 volunteer service hours, showing her dedication to our community. It's my pleasure to introduce Michaela Mayer. Good evening. I want to start off by thanking you all for the work you do for our schools, and thank you very much for allowing me the chance to speak tonight. I would also like to thank our board, who some members are sitting right there. Um, thank you for the amazing job you do utilizing the resources our district has and for being dedicated to doing the best you can. I've seen firsthand the furrowed brows and tense conversations that lead up to the decisions made during budget season. I see that our board fully recognizes their responsibility as well as the expectations, pressures, and scrutiny that they face. They always want the best for us students to challenge us, to nurture our creativity, and to push our boundaries. However, they can't always do that. Our district too many times is forced to consider taking one opportunity away to implement another. This choice may propel us towards further innovation, but it doesn't help with the sustainability of our programs. If we choose to just maintain the programs we have, then we won't be able to offer students a diverse range of topics to study or to further expand upon our innovation. This is why we struggle. We can't just add another class or an opportunity. We always have to make a choice. We always have to give something up in order to take something else on. Our goal is to maintain and sustain a diverse selection of classes, programs, and learning opportunities for our students. But it's a challenge to do that with what we currently, currently receive in revenue. My experience on serving on the Board of Education has helped me to understand our district situation by living through the eyes of both a student and a student representative. As a student representative, I understand that tough choices are necessary, as safety and mandated program is where our school district's money must go. I appreciate the board's effort to look into enhancing our safety with additions like an SRO, but there will always be a struggle of how to fund it. If we were to allocate money towards further safety measures, it would still be a trade-off, and we would have to take money away from another program. Why do we as students, the board, or even the community have to make that kind of choice? I value the education Maple Hill has given me, but I understand that limitations often make it hard for us to have all that we want. As a student, I wish I could have taken those extra courses like sign language, or have had the choice of more than one foreign language. As a student, I wish I could have gone on more field trips to those small businesses, science labs, or even traveled to see wildlife. As a student, there are so many things I wish I could have experienced in high school, and yet I understand. There will always be trade-offs, and being the student representative has helped me to see just that. Now, I may be a little biased, but I believe that Skodak has the best teachers. My teachers have always been positive and hopeful for change. They always make time for us students, sacrificing personal time to answer emails, adding extra hours to their long workday, and doing everything they can to help us succeed. Our teachers and staff are truly priceless and extremely passionate in what they do. Teachers have truly inspired me for the work they do under every and any circumstance. For this reason and more, I'm choosing to continue my education next year at SUNY Plattsburgh so that one day I may help the students in our school system as a special education teacher. I look forward to continuing our 10 school districts and everybody else in New York State's work so that my students will have the best opportunities and experiences. I advocate today and I choose to advocate tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you both to Mr. Chevier and Michaela for a wonderful presentation. Now we would like to transition into and begin our Q&A portion of tonight's program. To this time that I invite our legislators to please come up to the table to my right and take your seat. Tonight we're going to be collecting questions and comments for our legislators using Thought Exchange. 
To explain how that will work, I invite Dr. Marie Wiles, the superintendent of schools for the Gilderland Central School District, to join me at the podium. Dr. Wiles. Thank you so much, Kaysen. So um, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. Usually when you come to an event like this, we say, you know, please turn off your cell phones and put them away. I'm going to do the opposite right now and ask you to take out your device. And we're going to use a um, platform called Thought Exchange to gather from our audience the questions and comments you would like to direct to our elected officials so that we can hear both from the audience and for our uh, fine elected officials who are here with us tonight. So uh, as you open up your phone, you're going to want to go to this particular URL, thoughtexchange.com backslash join. And when you get there, it will prompt you to enter a nine-digit code, 868-088-478. And when you get there, it will welcome you to an exchange. It's going to ask you to accept some terms and conditions. Don't worry. You're not signing away your life. Um, and then it'll ask you to participate. And you're going to get a screen with a question that says, what questions and comments would you like to make to our elected officials tonight? You can write one question. You can write 15 questions. But the most important part of this activity is for you to read the questions of the others who are in the room, because you'll be able to see them and rank them on a scale of one to five for those questions you're most interested in hearing more about. And shortly, we will get a list of questions on the screen behind our legislators here. And Kaysen will come back and moderate our discussion through those questions. So what we'll do, for those of you at my right, is we're actually gonna collect those topics that are collectively of the most interest of our group, if all goes well. All right, and while everyone is thinking, because you need quiet to do that, I'm going to ask Kaysen to come back up and get the ball rolling a little bit. Thank you, Dr. Wiles. Before we get started here, if, if at any point in time tonight you're having any issues with thought exchange, uh, please raise your hand and one of our volunteers will come and assist you. So tonight, while everyone's thinking and everyone's getting their questions and put, I would just like to start with some general background information. And I'd like to ask a question that what is each of your experience and background in working with the state budget in terms of education? Uh, we'll start at the end with Senator Breslin and I guess we can work down the line from there. Can everyone hear me now? Okay. First of all, it's the first time I can remember that I've been placed on the far right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but at least the audience is looking at me at the far left. Uh, I guess because of my age and I've been around so long, I, I have had experience as the head of finance for the Senate Democrats at one point in time. I have been in the past on uh, the Education Committee. Uh, I currently am chairman of insurance, uh, which takes up a lot of time, and I'm also the vice president pro tem for the state senate. But education is the lifeblood of what we all need and what we all do. And without uh, us advocating, and I can go up and down this uh, panel and say everyone here and the ones they represent as well, are here to make sure that we increase, it comes down to increasing foundation aid. It comes down to dollars. And it comes down, when you look at studies, uh, I, I mean, I, it still blows my mind that we don't have mandatory pre-K programs, that we don't have mandatory kindergartens, which most people in the state of New York don't know. And when I've heard the stories here, and, and I thought that Michaela really uh, was ve very good in expressing uh, that's not to minimize the others, Mr. Aquario, Mr. Romanowski. You were, you were all wonderful, and they were perfectly selected. 
And that's the kind of representative we need, and that's the kind of representative we won't have unless we properly fund education. And it is bad that we do our budget in, in, uh, in April, April 1st, uh, which is one, uh, uh, we've begun to get on-time budgets, which, which we're supposed to have automatically. Uh, we have to have sufficient dollars so that programs will be successful. Now, I only have one school district here, and uh, I've already met with Dave per uh, Perry personally, uh, the new superintendent at South Colony. I meet with all my superintendents personally. I try to get to their schools to see what's going on. Uh, some of the schools that I rep, the school districts that I represent have uh, uh, particular problems with the formula. Uh, I frequently over the years have thought the formula was a, an absolute sham. That, that's why I go to schools because you can see and feel and touch the, the reasons that they're successful or not successful. When I looked at the, some of those exhibits to say that the 10 school districts here are similar to Scarsdale, please. Uh, and, that, and that the blame belongs on us. So it's my job as well as the others here to make sure that we look carefully at each school and come up with sufficient extra dollars so that you can meet your goals, particularly in light of the fact you're facing new uh, problems, including English as a second language, which is an enormous cost. You're, t you're facing, which no one really touched upon, uh, very significant mental health problems. And if you have someone uh, to deal with mental health problems at every school, that means you're going to eliminate a teacher unless we do something about it. Uh, the mandate in, and paying of uh, mental health workers in the school, to me, is a, an, an absolute, uh, I don't want to call it a no-brainer, that, uh, that we should do and, and uh, we should exempt the cost from the local districts. That's enough for me. Uh, my name is Patrick Crone, and I'm the uh, legislative director for Senator Jordan. Uh, just speaking for Senator Jordan, she was a legislative director herself in the state senate for six years, so she had very hands-on experience reading and uh, determining you know, different aspects of the state budget uh, under her predecessor, Senator Marchone. I also worked for Senator Marchone. I was the uh, education policy specialist there, uh, and I would say that uh, between Senator and I, we've probably seen 15, maybe 20 state budgets. This is an issue that I would say that both fairly experienced with. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alex Plazinski, legislative assistant to Senator Jim, Jim Tedisco, and a proud graduate of Avril Park High School. The Senator unfortunately could not attend due to a pri uh, pri previously scheduled event in his district. He wanted to let you know, as a former special education teacher, guidance counselor, athletic director, and coach, he knows how important it is for our school te uh, teachers and students to be provided with support and resources they need. That's why he has always fought for full and fair funding for our school districts in the 49th Senate District and throughout the Capital Region. He will continue to champion full and fair funding for our schools, and I will be the eyes and ears for the Senator tonight. Uh, he welcomes all school districts in and around the 49th District to reach out to our office so that we can set aside some time to discuss the much-needed funding in our districts across the Capital Region and New York State. Thank you all, and I look forward to uh, reporting back to the Senator tonight. Hi. Uh, I'm Jake Ashby. Experience in dealing with uh, school budgets uh, is somewhat limited, especially compared to uh, some of my colleagues up here, uh, like Senator Breslin. Very much like to keep him on the far right if we can. I don't know if that's possible, but it would be it would be nice. But the experience that I have, uh, you know, so far, unfortunately, we get uh, the budget very late in the evening, as I'm sure many of you are aware, and are forced to look at these problems in a very condensed time and so it's puts it puts all of us and this is not just a, a partisan issue this is democrats and republicans that were put into this but we do have opportunities throughout the year to look at, in, at issues and address these issues and i can say from my experience i do this in a bipartisan way i meet with uh, school districts they come up to our office i go to them i've done this with my colleague john mcdonald uh, on a number a uh, number of times and in some instances, we have been successful in being able to mitigate problems, and other, other times, unfortunately, we haven't. And I think a large part of that comes down to issues that we 
have heard about already, and I know that we're going to discuss uh, you know, throughout the evening tonight. But it's a pleasure to be here with you. And some of the things that I've also done uh, in my office, I enjoy coming out to the schools. We set up a service and action award, and I've been to every district, every school district within my assembly district and have awarded this to students who've gone, gone above and beyond as far as community service. And it's provided an opportunity for myself and my staff to get to know people in the district, students, staff, and families alike, and hear about the issues that are going on. So we really do our best to get out there and hear about these issues. Thank you for having me here tonight. Again, I'm Assemblywoman Pat Fahey. I have two school districts here, very proud to represent uh, Gilderlin as well as Voorheesville. Um, I have spent many years in and around uh, education issues uh, on and off, but going back to a few decades ago, working in Washington, D.C., for those of you who are old enough to remember Paul Simon, I'm originally from Illinois, and worked for Senator Paul Simon uh, uh, quite a number of years ago, and he was quite a champion of all things education uh, and wrote, uh, wrote, wrote a few books on it, including The Illiterate American. So, very, and so uh, that is really where I had quite a taste of, uh, of education. And then uh, um, over 15 years ago also uh, ran and served on the Albany School Board where my children went to school uh, through the Albany schools. Um, while I was educated in Illinois, I have to say, I, one of the first comments that was made tonight is uh, how proud people are of how New York does do it differently. And uh, I would concur, just the fact that my children um, uh, got music, uh, were exposed to languages at the very youngest ages. Um, I, I try to look at the glass half full. Uh, so I've had many years, and I should say I was on the school board. I was elected right after 9-11. And in those days, there was no such thing as passing a budget. The state didn't pass budgets on time. So we were adopting school budgets in May. Uh, some years, I think, we, we, we got the notice of what we'd be getting um, even after the May vote. It was a horrendous time, and, uh, and it was cuts every year, my entire four years on, this, on the Albany School Board. So I, am, I do look at the glass half full. I'm really proud that just a few years ago, we eliminated the, uh, or we addressed and finally solved the gap elimination uh, issue and uh, uh, sol cl closed that gap. In fact, I think it was the last time I was in this auditorium was on a, a meeting on that. But yes, we have a ways to go. And um, this is absolutely always one of the big challenges. And as my colleague, uh, Mr. Ashby, just said, uh, the last thing that's addressed in the budget is the, is the funding formula. In fact, it's a couple of hours before we end up adopt, begin adopting the, the budget. So look forward to hearing more tonight, but hope that gives you a little background. Thank you. Thank you. Hold it. Oh, you got to hold it for. There you go. I guess you have to hold it the whole time. Oh, though. my God. So, good evening. I'm John McDonald. Um, you know, quite honestly, when I look at the list of the districts here, I actually only represent the North Greenbush component of East Greenbush. But I'm very uh, happy to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. And as Jake had alluded to, um, we both um, share Rensselaer County. So, Rensselaer County's woes are, are shared between the two of us, regardless of where our legislative districts are. In regards to experience, um, I, you know, for 13 years, most of you know, I was the mayor of the city of Cohoes, and I actually worked very closely with our Cohoes City School District. So I know the challenges that districts struggle with, both inside the building, but just as importantly, outside the building. Uh, the last eight years, both Pat and I arrived in the assembly at the same time. We've, it's been quite an educational experience for us, too, as well. Um, the, the, candidly, we've seen about a seven billion dollar increase in total education aid going throughout statewide the problem has been continues to be and maybe in the future is the tortured relationship of the formula uh, when you plug money into it and run the formula even when you make well-intentioned modifications it doesn't always work out as well as you intend it to be and that's part of the challenge now Pat mentioned, and many of you know we've been around for a bit, four or five years ago, all we talked about was getting rid of gap elimination adjustment. I remember it very well, because here in East Greenbush, the superintendent at the time, it wasn't Jeff, was ecstatic, because over a million dollars in aid was increased in that one year to finalize the gap elimination adjustment. Meanwhile, 
my five city districts were like, had their head in their beer because of the fact they were getting a couple hundred thousand dollars and that was it. My point being is that because of the formula, because it's been tortured for decades, not just the last couple of years, there's winners and losers. Unfortunately, we want all of our children to, we, fortunately, we want all of our children to be winning, and that hasn't always happened. But thank you for the invitation to be here, and I look forward to uh, greater discussion. Uh, my name is Allison McLean Lane, and I'm the Legislative Director for Assemblymember Phil Steck. Um, Phil would have liked to have been here tonight, but of course, they're honoring uh, outgoing South Colony Superintendent at the Colony uh, Chamber tonight, and uh, he wanted to make sure he was there. Um, but I have been very heavily involved as his Legislative Director in education funding. Uh, Mr. Steck has, since uh, entering office in 2013, considered education funding a absolute legislative priority for him. Uh, he has dedicated himself uh, since 2013 to the one thing that really needs to get done, and that is New York State needs to raise revenue. Uh, in February of uh, 2019, so just a little under a year ago, uh, the New York State Comptroller came out with a report that said New York State has falling revenues and we have not done anything to increase them and we are not going to be able to meet our needs. Well, that has come to fruition. And so uh, Mr. Steck has had legislation since 2013 that would bring approximately $13 billion annually to New York State if we only taxed our largest export. Uh, but I will turn this over to um, Assemblywoman Walsh and uh, look forward to having a uh, robust discussion this evening. Hi, so I'm, I'm Mary Beth Walsh. I represent the 112th Assembly District, which is uh, mostly Saratoga County and a little bit of Schenectady County mixed in. Um, I guess before arriving at the Assembly four years ago, my biggest experience with the school budget was as a taxpayer, as a parent of six kids in a blended family that spans three different school districts, um, Saratoga, Burn Hills, and Niskayuna. So um, that's been interesting to see even the differences among the different school districts, what the strengths are. I represent um, school districts here, Scotia Glenville and Burn Hills, but um, I also have rural school districts like Galway in my, uh, that I represent. Every school district, it seems, has a very, um, has a unique spin and a unique way. And I think we saw that tonight with some of the presentations. Um, there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, common uh, curriculum or perhaps, but in the, the way that the extras are done, I think is unique. Galway, for example, does, I think, a great job introducing STEM um, and through agriculture um, and through uh, um, the FFA, the Future Farmers of America. And I think that's a really unique program. But anyway, the question I'm trying to answer is my experience with the state education budget. So uh, I am, as of last year, I became the uh, minority ranker on education in the assembly. So uh, my, um, my colleague, uh, Chairman Benedetto, is the chairman of the education committee. So there's two, there's two main things. There's the budget. There's the development of the education budget. And then there is the policy piece that um, can happen in the budget, in the budget process, or outside of the budget through bills that are produced anytime during session. And session runs from between January, so we just started until this year. We should be um, knocking wood, um, breaking by about um, June 2nd or so. So um, I think that, um, you know, I find the the entire foundation aid formula um, a little mystifying. I, I don't know. I'm still trying to learn it. it, it is, it's very confusing um, to me, and I really rely upon uh, real experts like Superintendent Dr. McGrath and um, uh, the other superintendents that I meet with and speak with who understand it and can explain it to me in ways that a human being can understand. So I, um, you know, I, I appreciate the invitation to be here tonight. I'm here more to listen than to talk. But um, I'll certainly try to. I'm seeing the questions popping up on the screen, and so um, I think we'll be uh, we'll be answering some of them now, maybe. Thank you all. And um, just to start, one of these questions that jumps out to me first is that if state aid continues to decrease, 
What is it you suggest that districts represented here need to change to maintain a balanced budget? Uh, we can start off with Senator Breslin. First of all, we ought to look at the cap. You know, as inflation goes up and our expenses go up, to keep that cap where it is sometimes is uh, unrealistic and very detrimental to the school districts. So it should be on the table to be discussed. Uh, and we have to insist every year, look at New York City. We have a Court of Appeals decision that's now approaching 20 years old that said that the school system in New York City was so bad it was unconstitutional. Not perform it did not give even a, an adequate education to anyone. And it directed the New York State uh, legislature and the governor to make amends by paying the back monies deserving of New York City. That's never been completely done. In recent years, I think we've made attempts to uh, provide additional monies uh, to our, our school budgets reflected in the amounts of money. Inflation keeps biting away, and that cap begins to push it down. So we have to look at the total uh, monies given each school district each year, look at where it's problematic, and make decisions. I will say in our Senate, uh, our, our chairman, uh, Shelley Mayer from Westchester County, has been extraordinarily uh, involved in each and every of the 700 school districts. I know... On occasions, I have gone to her and I'm saying, I have a school district that is desperately in need of additional monies because they happen to be an aberration in terms of the formula, and I would tell her why. Uh, within weeks, she would get back to me, and in one case, uh, there was a school district that used to call me, um, I think they had it on a program uh, that I'd get at least one call a day. Uh, that was until they got 11, an 11 percent increase in foundation aid after I had talked to, uh, discussed it with Senator Mayer. And I haven't received any phone calls since. Uh, and there's a message in there, too. Uh, uh, but it's all about, I said before, and I'll repeat it again, it's all about dollars, and it's up to all of us to find a way to achieve those dollars to make sure our children uh, have a quality education, uh, and we're not doing that at this point in time. Uh, I'm, I'm blessed to have three children who went through public school education uh, successfully, and now uh, my grandchildren are on their way through as well. Uh, and, but every one of us have an investment in making sure that happens. If, uh, if anyone else would like to add their thoughts to the topic, you may do so. Um, so the question was that um, if state aid continues to decrease, you know, what do you suggest that these smaller di these smaller districts of average wealth do to maintain a balanced budget? I, I know it's running really late, so I'm going to just briefly say a couple of words, and we'll keep moving. If uh, just because I. Um uh, it, I, I want to say that I, a huge shout out to the extraordinary creativity and innovativeness that we have seen across school districts right across the board. Uh, as my colleague, uh, Assemblymember McDonald, pointed out, we know that, uh, and we've been incredibly proud of trying to, of, of finally closing uh, the gap, uh, the, the uh, gap elimination um, uh, problem that was there for a number of years, and I know that gave some districts a boost. Um, uh, but but I will say the the other thing that I have noticed in the last few years is the leveraging of resources as well as relying on state aids uh, as, on, on state grants outside state grants. I saw some questions pop up about mental health services, and I've seen some of our districts uh, bring in some mental health services on site and working with some health providers around the um, uh, around the region. Uh, at, at low or no cost to the school districts, and then and then the students aren't leaving. So I've seen some really creative, innovative programs. Um, uh, we also are providing more state grant funds, whether it's pre-K, uh, doing a little better on after school, although I shared the frustration expressed here earlier that we haven't moved the needle on, on um, to, to the degree that we need to on after school programs. And, and I still have uh, both my districts here as representative not uh, added in pre-K yet. So we know that we haven't gone as far, 
Um, but I think the leveraging of resources and that said, uh, there is it, it, keep doing what you did a few years ago, but there is no better constituency than the school community in terms of keeping the pressure on funding on education. This year, I'd say in, in my seven years, uh, this year you have the most competition because we've started the year with a multi-billion dollar shortfall in health care. Uh, so this this year, in since I have been here, it's been, I'd say, the most challenging because you have two big issues on each side. Um, uh, education that usually is where members are very drawn to and where we've put the most. Uh, everything else is held to about 1%, 2% increase. The only thing that has really exceeded that in recent years is education. One of the only things that's exceeded that. This year... You know, we've already said we will be exceeding both on health care as well as on education. Uh, so in that regard, uh, I know you have a lot of support behind this table for it, that we will continue, and, and then we've got to look at how to balance this out. I also want to say the formula is a mess. Um, I, I have talked to both chairs on both sides in the Senate and in the Assembly, and yes, we, we do need to go back at it. The problem is somebody wins, somebody loses. And... Um, uh, do I think we're going to completely upend any formula this year? No, I don't, because it's it's too politically charged. So hope that answers some of it, and I know other colleagues are trying to jump in. So the only thing I want to mention, you know, obviously the answer always is money. That's not always the easiest one to come about. But, you know, putting resources aside, uh, obviously modifications to the formula can be challenging. We know that. We'll try to work through that best we can. And this is why these forums are critical. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, Pat, myself, and I think Neil get to turn around and do the same thing tomorrow morning at 8.30 over in the Capital Region BOCES. So we'll be doing a similar type forum there, and Phil as well. The other thing, though, that's important, and, you know, last year was a decent year for most districts, not all. But we also were able to move the dial on a lot of barriers that really limited districts, things that were layups and simple things that for several years never got passed. Some of which, particularly when it comes to your transportation budgets, will allow some expense reduction. So yes, it's always about adding revenue, but let's look at the other side of the ledger. Let's look at expense reduction. I know one of the, and I've already met with our Quest Arbosis folks. We, we meet a lot during the summer and the fall. And we've met with the Capital Region Bosis folks and a consistent message is coming from them Albany, and I also have the Warren Washington, the Wishy Boses, is about regional high schools. Now, it's not talking about getting rid of your local high school. It's about providing additional opportunities. The students did a great job talking about the programs that are there. We know that every school can't do every single thing, and quite frankly, in some circumstances, not, that, not, not, not be the best use of all taxpayers' dollars, but if we can provide our children that opportunity whether they're in New Lebanon or whether they're in Green Island, let's see how we can do that. And I know regional high schools is something that we're still trying to understand where that could go to, but if it's a program that can lead to expense reduction and free up resources within the district to maintain that local input, it's worth pursuing. I think, uh, <clears throat> I think that it puts the district in a very difficult situation because there's not much maneuverability uh, when it comes to uh, the current the, the current situation that we find ourselves in so it makes me think that there needs to be a policy change you know at the state level to help with that and it's something that we're confronted with not just in education but in unfunded mandates at the county level and it's been suggested through other pieces of legislation uh, you know that I've supported that instead of having mandates, having a menu of options and giving the autonomy to the communities that are, you know, that are supposed to be delivering, implementing, and you know, providing these services, the opportunity to choose. And I think when we're dealing with limited resources that we're looking at right now, it may be time to start discussing and, and looking at that. Uh, that's not to say you know, that we should be uh, not fulfilling our most basic needs, but I think uh, home rule is a big is a big belief for many of us many of us in the legislature and many many of you in here and it's an opportunity to exercise that at an even higher level so it could be something that uh, hopefully uh, you will entertain and it's something that I certainly support all right um, for this next question um, something that assemblywoman Fahey in her statement 
kind of stuck out to me was about mental health. And, you know, as we've kind of, over the past few years, we've seen in a society mental health kind of take a much greater focus than it has in the past. So, and in, a, in, in accordance to that, schools have been taking on additional responsibilities related to the mental health of their students. How do you believe we'll fund this without kind of doing any unnecessary damage to instruction? I'm going to jump in on that first. Um, you know, as, as a practicing pharmacist, I, I see the mental health issues both clinically in the community, but also I understand it in schools. And, you know, where we started something a couple of years ago, and it's referenced here in our agenda this night, is the community school funding. Yeah, there's a $50 million increase this year. We need to expand it to more districts. And we need to make sure it's expanded without restrictions because who knows better than those who are running the schools on what mental health needs are in their schools, but also who are the community partners that can come in. I know several years ago in Cohoes, we established a strong working relationship with St. Catharines to bring in mental health in the actual school, dedicated space because it allowed a child to see a provider during the course of the school day, so valuable seat time is not lost. Now that may not work in Skodak, or maybe it will work with another partner, but you know what's in your community. Let's make sure that community school funding, as we continue to build on it, because it was a novel idea. It was only $50 million a couple of years ago when it first started. It's, going, it's growing and growing. Let's expand it to more districts to meet the needs, because the last two years, I've heard from every superintendent that is their biggest crisis, is mental health challenges in the district. And let's, let's listen and let's respond. Just very briefly, because I know others are trying to get in on this, I, I just want to echo um, uh, the comments and, and mention, um, it was actually the former Voorheesville superintendent who said what we need to teach is resiliency among all children. Uh, mental health is a crisis everywhere we look, and so we are providing more state funding. Uh, we're providing it, uh, it across so many programs, whether it's uh, with homelessness, with uh, the opioid crisis, we're seeing um, uh, the need for mental health issues, uh, uh, mental health funding there. Um, veterans, you name it, it is, I, I think it's just permeating every level and, and uh, of society as well as every type of, of program. Um, so we are seeing more state grant funds, and I know that's difficult, especially for some of the small districts, to go after additional state funding, but it is out there. And I have to say, uh, the creativeness of school districts bringing in the providers right on site so that it's essentially, uh, the, the main cost has been just uh, restructuring a, a classroom or, uh, or a corner of a building to make sure that they can bring on um, some mental health services on site. But it is also, I know we ask you to do everything, um, but it is also just this, this across the board teaching resiliency of, uh, of all of our children to try to cope with uh, all they are facing. So um, the good news is this is getting attention at every level. I would just like to add that in addition to working um, with the State Assembly, I'm also, I've been a practicing attorney for about 30 years, and about the last dozen or so years, I've been working primarily in family court, where I've really seen firsthand the, um, and I mostly represent kids in family court too, so I've, I've really seen um, unaddressed mental health needs really reflected in the family court system, so I... Um, I'm a big proponent of um, mental health services being provided wherever they can be provided. I think the school is a, is a great place to provide it if it can, because I know that a lot of um, kids can't get to their appointments otherwise. Um, they, it, we know that they're, for lack of a better phrase, I guess, a kind of a captive audience it, within the school. Um, sometimes parents lack transportation or don't, or maybe are dealing with their own problems where they can't get the kids to their appointments. So um, I do think that there's a big benefit, but I think, and I think it may be something that my colleague um, Assemblyman Ashby mentioned, but I think it's really important as state representatives that we give maximum 
discretion and control, local control with each individual school district to make the to, and the school boards to make the decisions that make the most sense for your individual communities. And I, I really think that while we could talk about the, what we see as, as a valuable program or a valuable idea, I'm, I'm much more in support of um, giving permission rather than mandating, um, particularly an unfunded mandate, falling upon the school district. So that's just something I always try to keep in mind as we're, as we're voting on these things. I'm afraid we only have time for one more question, but this is one that I believe should definitely be asked. As a few of you have mentioned before, the state aid formula is very confusing, and as somebody who personally has tried their best to read it, it's like a whole other language. So the question that has been asked is, how can the formula be adjusted to properly reflect the needs of the individual school district? This has been a debate. I, this has been a debate for decades, and again, I'm in, I guess I've just started my eighth year, and uh, I was told when starting that maybe four people in the entire state really understand this formula. And I, and I, I was just going to say, in one retired and actually, yeah, passed away. Um, um, so, uh, again, there are efforts to go back at the formula, um, but in the end, the formula is done, and, and then uh, there is some tinkering at the end, uh, Senator, uh, or there's some um, monies that are set aside, uh, sometimes referred to as bullet aid. Um, I'm very grateful because when we've had uh, the formula not work out in a huge way, uh, last year, we were able to help uh, Voorheesville out and, and saved a couple of positions uh, because of it. Uh, but those are those are one shots, complete one shots. And I, um, uh, it, so it's not it's not a way to do a formula. But the the question, unfortunately, to properly reflect, if I'm reading the same question, to properly reflect the needs of individual school districts. <laughs> Everybody, wherever you are in the state, we're going to hear it from uh, rural, we're going to hear it from Long Island, uh, from upstate, from everybody. And, and then I, I think before, the, before we even came back into session, we had heard Rochester was all, already 40 million, isn't it 40 million, already um, in the hole this year. 40 million, one school district. Last year, if, I, if my number, if my... Um, if my memory serves me right, Voorheesville was, not Voorheesville, Yonkers was over $50 million short. So they're big numbers. It causes huge problems, and the formula, no formula is going to address that. Uh, it, it, you know, so the, the problem really does, I, I hate to say it, it goes beyond the formula, and... Um, uh, you know, I know there's a commitment to continuing to review that, but in the short term, we have to stay with the foundation aid formula and fix it, the most egregious problems, as, uh, as the senator pointed out. Um, I would also, I, I echo uh, Assemblywoman Fahey's uh, words, absolutely. Um, for example, South Colony um, and... Uh, uh, we're very pleased that uh, Dr. Perry is here. Um, they, it didn't take into consideration um, for especially average wealth school districts like South Colony, which is an assemblyman Stex district. They were very conservative up until when you know the market crashed and the way that they taxed their um, constituency and you know and, and not building up a huge reserve, et cetera, so that when the tax cap came in, the gap elimination adjustment came in, there was not a lot to cut. And they had to half their, I believe it was special education, and it was a, a really hard thing for them. And, uh, you know, we have another school district in the district, the Manan School District. It's a small school district, I believe, in uh, Albany County with only about 257 in its physical plant. But it also has the largest homeless shelter in all of Albany County. Now, it's not these children's fault that they are in transitional housing. They need an education. They deserve an education, and they are welcomed with open arms. But many of these students, for example, are coming from places that are outside New York State. So that school district, with its very small $8 million budget, was not receiving current year aid for those students. A lot of those students had significant uh, spe special education needs. There were psychological issues that had to be dealt with. 
um, being, you know, being in transitional housing, certainly uh, there were mental health challenges, and uh, of course um, there were healthcare challenges, and there was social work that needed to be done. They didn't even have a social worker. So these are issues that the, form the, the foundation aid formula, though well intended to ensure that um, the students that are the most economically disadvantaged receive this funding and receive their educational needs are met. It doesn't necessarily take into consideration things that are already, situations that already exist in a district or situations that can happen in a district during a current year. And uh, certainly bullet aid has been helpful. Um, as Assemblyman uh, Fahey did mention, certainly uh, uh, Assemblyman Steck has tried to help out. Uh, various districts every single year when they they have specific problems like the problem that uh, he was facing with the Manan School District um, but you know it is a formula which means it doesn't necessarily it's not a one-size-fit-all and every school district and every community has its own needs and uh, so those are some of the things that do have to be taken into consideration thank you I would just mention <clears throat> um, I, mean, I don't know if there's a perfect solution, and the reality is New York State itself is extremely diverse. Um, you know, my district, we have urban, as as urban is going to be with Albany and Troy, with children 23, 24 percent in poverty. Um, we also have suburban districts. I like consider East Greenwich a suburban district, but there's also a lot of rural districts that really have some significant amount of poverty and challenges, and then you throw in the whole transportation component. The one thing that might be a good place to start from my perspective, is that there are many school districts, about three, 400, that are overfunded, according to the foundation aid formula. Well, you know what? Maybe we ought to tap the brakes there, kind of help everybody else catch up a little bit and try to get to an equilibrium. Maybe that might be a good starting point. That's kind of what I think would be a good stepping point. And that's where hopefully we can get that conversation going because I think that's probably the best way to get everybody to an equilibrium so at least everyone's being treated fairly because, you know, it's very clear uh, many districts are not. I just have to add, uh, um, trying to take away from any school district becomes politically very difficult. And so I know we would say there are some who are overfunded. I, I just, I can't let that go. Um, friendly comment to my colleague. Okay. It tapped the brakes. Even tapping the brakes has been politically very difficult because of the, um, uh, the property tax cap, which I think has uh, served very well in a, in a very global sense uh, with predictability and, um, and stemming the, the pressure. You know, but, but so much of this is because we have really relieved the pressure on local property tax payers and taken it on at the state level. I mean, the, the seven billion that John mentioned just since just in the last few years is just absolutely unprecedented. It's unheard of around the country in terms of what we've been able to put in. But the squeeze is because we, we no longer are relying on property tax uh, uh, payers, and that's the right thing. It just in the short term, it's it's very very difficult. So I just need to add that one other thing, and they're not here, so I feel I can say it. And what the heck, I'm you know, uh, uh, my understanding is on Long Island alone, 200 of the 700 school districts are right there. So and it, you know, so that is part of the point of we have some. Uh, really, really small school districts right next door and a few blocks away from another school district. Again, not trying to pick on a region who's not represented here, but um, uh, the reference he made to, to somewhere we might tap the brakes are often uh, elsewhere around the state, and that's it's been a politically difficult thing to do. And again, um, but but the uh, the fact that we do have 200 in just one region is uh, also adds to those costs. So. I assume some of them are getting better at leveraging services and working together as well, and BOCES, I think, has served a great purpose uh, on that, but it adds to the cost. W one last thing, mandates. Uh, I just would be remiss if I didn't mention mandates, uh, although I had uh, the former speaker once challenged me to say, give me one we can actually pass. Um, but if, if there are certain things that, um, uh, as John mentioned, there were some mandates with busing, some of the school busing issues that we were able to get through last year. If there's others along that line that help at the margins, we're happy to take a look at those again. Thank you. 
I agree with uh, Assembly McDonald's uh, suggestion of tapping the brakes, but we also don't want to punish the schools that are doing things right. And every every district in here is uh, is doing very well and doing the right thing with limited resources. And so I think we need to examine that uh, you know potential change carefully and make and and make those changes uh, you know deliberately, but in a way that is not done in the middle of the night with limited time. And I, I, again, I go back to the process in, in which we're currently making these changes. And I think, I think we need to take a hard look at that process. And when I say that you know, these districts that are represented here are, are doing it right, both of my parents were employees of, of Skodak Central Schools. I'm a product of Skodak Central Schools. My participation in government teacher in high school is here, sitting right in front of me. So I, I firmly understand, uh, you know, how, how, <laughs> yeah. So he may not think we did everything right. <laughs> but it, it's something that we need to, uh, you know, take on in a deliberate way, but also not rush through because it's something that has really systemic impacts. To end on a good note, I think that uh, we have to recognize that to many of the parents who are here, we have extraordinary superintendents in, in, among these schools and wonderful teachers, and there's a good part. Even though there's been flat funding, and even though we need a lot more money, we also heard the successes in each of the schools, and those successes are dramatic and positive and speak well for our students now and in the future. So congratulations to each and every one of you for what you do. Uh, keep putting the pressure on the ones who aren't doing enough to give you the money. And uh, the squeaky wheel does get the grease. And I, I always tell every school district, come in as, much, uh, as many times as you'd like to go over things because you all have unique needs, uh, but you've all been successful in what you do by making that nickel go a little further. Thank you. All right, and on that note, that will end our Q&A session. Once again, I'd like to thank all the representatives here for taking the time to be here and answer the questions of the community. And I'd also like to thank all of you who submitted or, or had reviewed a question for showing that this really is a problem that you are all passionate about. At this time, I'd like to turn the mic over to Mr. Simons and Dr. Wiles to share a response to the governor's proposed budget and to provide legislative solutions to our legislators. Thank you again, Kaysen, and thank you again for the thoughtful responses. We all recognize what a challenging issue this is uh, for our legislator, legislators as well as for our schools. Um, two weeks ago, the governor released his executive budget proposal for schools, and we just wanted to offer a few comments during this forum about that. Uh, we've passed out to each of our respective legislators the New York State School Boards Association positions regarding the governor's budget. So there's an opportunity for you to take that information back to your respective offices. And there are copies of the proposals of the New York State School Boards Association and their analysis available as, uh, as you exit this evening. Uh, the governor, uh, in one of his proposals, uh, you know, we got our state aid runs um, probably the, the night of the executive budget release because our legislators are very responsive. And at first glance, it looked like we got a lot more aid. But when you read uh, the fine print and the governor's executive budget document, aids that were typically separate based on the expenses of our district, such as transportation aid, BOCES aid, textbook aid, library aid, and technology, were now combined, consolidated, and rolled into the foundation aid, making it even more confusing for our citizens, A, to understand some of our challenges, and even for superintendents to predict and determine what our revenues are going to be. So we are advocating that you consider not including expense-driven aids within the foundation aid formula because we fear the inclusion of these important aids, which reimburse our districts for expenses which are, we are incurring now, will be the beginning of a process that further reduces our aid above and beyond the trend that we've been speaking about tonight with our district receiving minimal state aid increases over the last three years. 
These monies are used to transport our school students safely for busing. They're used to ensure that our instructional materials are provided in the classroom. And these, this aid category called BOCES aid enables us to collaborate with other districts to save the taxpayers money by, ser by sharing services and programs through our BOCES. By consolidating these aids into the foundation aid and potentially reducing the reimbursement for expenses that we are incurring will discourage and provide disincentives for us to work together. Second issue within the governor's budget proposal involves shifting the state's share of responsibility for students that receive special education services in residential facilities across our state. Each district represented in this room works diligently to ensure that special education services are received by our students in our home schools and in our home districts. But at times based, to, based on significant needs, some of those that Dr. Perry talked about tonight, our communities place students in special programs in residential facilities, and currently New York State pays 18% of the cost. The governor's executive budget proposes to shift that 18% to our localities. And our preliminary estimate in East Greenbush is that that proposal would increase our cost per each of these students by about $26,000 per student, monies we don't have. This proposal further stretches our resources needed to meet the needs of the children within our district. So we ask you to consider opposing that cost shift for our students, some of our most needy students, uh, who are unfortunately in need of residential placement and receiving of their services outside of our district. And last but certainly not least, and we've heard us talk all night about foundation aid, the governor's executive budget proposal for foundation aid, when you separate out the transportation and the categories of expense-driven aid falls $1 billion short, $1 billion short of what all educational groups, including our school boards, our Board of Regents, and our Educational Conference Board has indicated is needed just to maintain current educational needs and services next year. So we ask you, as you have advocated this evening, to really take a close look at the Governor's Executive Budget proposal, particularly in regard to foundation aid. We recognize it's not easy. We recognize it's hard to hear uh, about, the, about some of the challenges of our district. We recognize that you appreciate and understand them. But we also wanted to end this forum this evening by giving you some ideas for other things that you could do for us at the state level that would help us that don't involve increasing school aid. I'm going to ask Dr. Wiles to come up and give you some, uh, some issues that we've worked on together to try to help us in our schools that go above and beyond increasing our money. Dr. Wiles. Good evening once again, everyone. I know the hour is getting late, so I'm not going to give a dissertation on these seven ideas we have for our elected officials. Um, but I do want to be um, honest about where this came from. Uh, when I called Assembly Member Pat Fahey to invite her, she said, Marie, I know the districts need more resources, and I know why you need more resources. Do you have any ideas for how we can help you that maybe go beyond that? So I picked up the phone and called Jeff Simons and said, can we uh, get together and brainstorm some thoughts? So I'm going to share brainstormed thoughts, and these are the start of a conversation, and we're happy to follow up at another time uh, to talk more about them. The first one I'll just say as a reiteration of what Mr. Simons just said, and that is based on the governor's proposal, we need to decouple foundation aid and expense-driven aid uh, for all the reasons he already described. Um, but here's uh, the second one is may maybe something we haven't thought about. Every one of our school districts is immersed in talking about student safety. And many of us over the years have added one, two, or more school resource officers. Uh, they are hard to come by, and they are very expensive. So one thing that would not uh, add to school aid is could there be um, a consideration of increasing the pension cap for retired police officers who wish to serve as school resource officers. Is that a possibility? It would save us money. It would provide skilled, trained professionals an opportunity to continue to use those skills in a way that could benefit all. Similarly, we have huge uh, shortages of educators in all kinds of levels of our work, from administrators to facts teachers to uh, 
teachers of other languages to students with uh, teachers of students with disabilities could we think about raising the cap for earnings for retired educators i know it was just raised, raised from 30 to 35000 dollars why not even a little bit higher to bring back people who are skilled and frankly usually uh, miss students when they retire and want to come back anyway make it possible for them to do that without a penalty um, we've talked a lot about mental health tonight, and I'm really proud to be one of those school districts that has an on-site mental health clinic, but I'll tell you, it was like pulling teeth to get it. It took uh, eight months before we had full approval and before we actually had a clinician in the space that we had ready to go on September 1. There is a ton of red tape. There are a lot of uh, hoops you have to jump through. Getting approval is very difficult, and the one piece that we think is really good in Gilderland is we're able to transport students from their uh, existing school building to our middle school where the clinic is, and the Department of Health will no longer approve that. So you'd have to have a clinic in every building in order to be approved, which is just ridiculous. We could use some help with that. Um, here's a very concrete thing. There are very limited test sites for bus drivers in the capital region. There are very few bus drivers in the capital region. Adding an additional one uh, would be very helpful. Uh, we'd also talk about evaluating the tax cap formula. Some of that came up tonight. The one I would, the piece of the tax cap formula I would underscore is how pilots are used in that. Pilots can be devastating for school districts from year to year as they calculate their tax levy limit. It should be counted as part of the, um, uh, the growth factor in that formula, step two. We can talk more about that. And then the last one wouldn't cost any more money, but that is to authorize school districts to decline designation as a school, um, designation as a polling place for elections outside of school budget elections. It is a hardship to open up buildings uh, for the community to come in when, when our children are in session. It's something to at least give school districts some discretion about. So those are our top seven. We're happy to talk more about them um, at another point. Um, but I want to thank Pat for pushing us to do better work. And I want to thank my colleagues for doing that good work. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Now, before we leave tonight, we have a video prepared that we're going to show here. Tonight, we've been talking about the educational system of the state and a lot of the serious implications that it has. But tonight, to end it off, we'd like to show you some of the ways that our schools have kind of overcome that and a lot of the great opportunities that our schools provide. We participate in the university and the high school class, so I've taken, by the end of my senior year, 29 credits, which puts me one credit away from being a sophomore when I enter college in the fall. One of the things I value is that Columbia offers really just a wide variety of elective classes that no matter what you're interested in doing in the future, no matter what you're interested in, you, know, you, have, a, you have a spot at Columbia, you have a class for you. I'm a big part of the music department. The music department just allows my creativity to flourish and allows me to really bring out what I want in myself and challenge myself in very unique and special ways. I've been part of Student Council, Spirit Club, National Honor Society, and a few other clubs here. And they really prepared me to show my leadership. I like being an auto tech because I like to be able to know about my own vehicles and how they run and how I can take that into the outside world and be able to purchase my own vehicle as well as be able to fix it. Science Research is a three-year program that you are accepted into at the end of freshman year. So it's sophomore through senior year where you complete your own research. And I started in my sophomore year and it really taught me a lot about science li literature. I've taken many university classes here. I've taken university bio, university business, English, Spanish. And out of those classes, yes, the workload is pretty intense, but they've definitely taught me many skills that I'm gonna need to know when I go to college. That personal finance class, we kind of, if you've ever heard a college student say, man, I wish I learned this in high school, that's what we're learning about. We're learning about how to file for an auto loan. We're learning about how to fill out our taxes. We're learning about how to, you know, how to finance a mortgage, all that kind of stuff to help you get prepared for the future. With the knowledge that you have, and so you won't have to worry about what you have to do next and 
how are you gonna pay for the next thing when you can be able to try and figure it out yourself? I started um, the project that I'm working on with my mentors at Albany Medical College. Um, I've been working there since June of 2018, so it's been really awesome to see a project like start to finish. And I'm listed as a contributor on my um, mentor's research paper, so it's pretty cool having that experience in high school, and I wouldn't have been able to do that without science research at Columbia. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, our forum tonight has ended. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this very important event, and we hope that it was informative and that it will help lead to some positive actions on behalf of our local schools. I'd like to give a thank you tonight to everyone who has made this event possible, including the students, parents, and the school staff of our planning committee, all of our student volunteers who sacrificed their time to be here tonight, and our facility staff who helped get all of this set up. As a special thank you to our distinguished guests who came here tonight and engaged in a lot of productive conversation about our school needs. Hope you all drive safely and enjoy the rest of your evening tonight.